Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to Game Changer. I'm Maryam Zia. Tonight we will be diving into the monumental happenings that are going uh, to be happening in, of course, 2024. 2024 is being dubbed as the election year, as the biggest election year uh, of history, uh, with elections happening in uh, more than uh, 60 countries in this year. Uh, of course, uh, more than half of the world's population is going to be selecting their representatives. And of course, uh, more than uh, 4 billion people are going to be casting their votes. And how these elections, global elections, are going to be changing uh, dynamics of the geopolitics of the world and uh, economic stability of the world, uh, we will be exploring in today's program. Of course, uh, Pakistan is also uh, set to hold its own elections uh, uh, that is going to be held on February the 8th. And we will be exploring uh, what lessons Pakistan can learn from other de democracies of the world. And of course, uh, when we talk about these global elections, many may view these elections as a mere spectacle. Uh, but we recognize its importance and we understand that they have the potential to be a game changer. Uh, what are the implications of these elections and specifically the elections that are going to be taking place in key players like US, we will be exploring uh, in today's program uh, the geopolitical uh, ramifications of these global elections. We will be discussing in today's program to discuss this and more. We are joined in the studios by Mr. Sher Yar Khan, who is an uh, analyst uh, and, uh, of course, a uh, 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 international affairs expert. Welcome to the program. We're also joined by Dr. Zafar Nawaz Jaspal, who is expert in international affairs. Welcome to the program. We will be uh, now watching a report that our team has prepared on these global elections. Let's watch the report. Globally, more voters than ever in history will head to the polls as at least 64 countries plus the European Union, representing a combined population of about 50% of the people in the world, are meant to hold elections. The results will both reflect and impact an increasingly precarious geopolitical and economic environment. As Pakistan approaches its next general elections, with voting scheduled for the 8th of February, the political landscape is buzzing with activity. There is a sense of anticipation and excitement surrounding the fate of the country's economy and political stability. The impact of a changes in leadership will lead to shifts in foreign relations, economic strategies and global engagement. Bangladesh Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina appears set to win a fourth consecutive term in January, though the election is being boycotted by the country's main opposition party in protest of the months-long crackdown on political dissent. India a country of 1.4 billion people who speak more than 100 languages will use the ballot box to decide who will govern them. This year, Indians will be electing members of the 18th National Parliament. The party or coalition that controls the National Parliament will in turn select the Prime Minister. Modi's government has jailed and intimidated opponents while otherwise squeezing a little room for political debate. The BJP has also benefited from the weaknesses of the Congress party, which dominated Indian politics for a country's first six decades but has faded since. Continued electoral dominance of BJP means further erosion of India's democracy. Modi's unattractive autocratic tendencies, reflected in curbs on independent journalism, mystery deaths of opponents abroad and the brutal army crackdown in Kashmir, will raise doubts about the poll's fairness. While Vladimir Putin may be embarking on a re-election campaign, the March presidential election results, the vote breakdown can be viewed as a potential indicator of the strongman's support and whether the Russian public continues to back his policies. Meanwhile, in Ukraine, it's unclear if a planned 2024 presidential vote will take place, while the nation is currently under the martial law. Though incumbent leader Volodymyr Zelensky has said he intends to seek another term, and his rating remains high. The European Parliament election, it may not rival the national parliaments in power, and it's the weakest of the EU's governing institutions. However, it wields on one significant power. It has the ultimate say in selecting the new president of the European Commission, the EU's real powerhouse. Citizens of the EU's 27 member states will select the 720 parliamentarians to serve from 2024 to 2029. Because the EU election crosses so many borders, it will be the world's biggest transnational election. And no election in 2024 will be more consequential than the US general elections. Up for grabs are the presidency, one-third of the seats in the Senate and all the seats in the U.S. House of Representatives. The presidential race is setting up to be a rerun of the 2020, with Joe Biden squaring off against Donald Trump, if Trump wins. 
He will join Grover Cleveland as the only American president to serve two non-consecutive terms. Whether Trump or Biden can move on their agenda will depend in good part on what happens in Congress. As you mentioned, 2024 is not just an election year. It is the election year where about 50% of the world population will decide their fate, as those results will impact the increasingly geopolitical and economic environment. This is Mohammed Abdullah Dar, PDV World News, Islamabad. We watched this report on global elections. Uh, Dr. Jaspal, let me start with you. Of course, uh, the significance of these elections uh, is um, uh, apparent that more than, of course, half of the world's population is going to be selecting their representatives. Uh, there are some uh, countries where they are, there are uh, functioning democracies. How do you see uh, the importance of these elections and uh, do you think that these are going to be having some ripple effects uh, throughout the world? Uh, if we can focus on these elections, of course, when we try to analyze them theoretically and practically, in a one word sentence we say yes, these elections will be having an impact on the geopolitics. They will be having impact at the national, regional and at the international level. If you see that these elections, the numbers which we have very rightly pointed out that 60 countries, but half a world population is going to elect their rulers, uh, what kind of the change? The most important thing is that generally the commonality in all these elections would be only an election. Mm -hmm. Different countries have a different political systems, they have a different political cultures, and within their the political cultures there are different streams of parochial, participatory or subjective cultures. So every state's, you can say, election outcome, election outlook will be entirely different. Mm. There would be some countries where there be, will be continuity of the policies and... and yes, uh, in that context for Pakistan, three elections are very significant. One is, of course, Bangladesh election, because it's in our region. There will be a continuity of the policy, continuity of the political system. And at the same time, the new regime will be same, but balancing. Second, most important for us is India, because Indian election is more important as it's a neighboring state, rival state, but the most important or challenging is that since 2014, in the Indian elections, the BJP winning factor is anti-Pakistan, Hindutva vote, ultra-nationalist, so we are very much afraid mm -hmm. maybe they could go for some kind of a false flag. Mm -hmm. So that's the most important and third could be with reference to as Sharia was mentioning earlier starting of the discussion that BRICS and with reference to the BRICS we can find South Africa is significant. Mm -hmm. Apart and US from that, election let's not forget US yeah, well, election. US election will be same but we have to keep in mind here we think that in the American system maybe let's say Democrats are today tomorrow Republicans. My understanding is on Pakistan. United States has a bipartisan consensus. So whosoever will be sitting in the White House, more or less same kind of the policies will continue. And uh, Pakistan's place will be remain there. The Americans will continue looking Pakistan, whether it's a Trump administration, uh, whether it's a continuity of the re Democrats or Republicans. They are going to look Pakistan from the prism of or from the goggles of the India. Right. And then, of course, EU is one of the most right. important. 27 countries will be participating. And we are with them. This, uh, uh, and then our own election. And that will be measured because our next uh, kind of a EU uh, relationship will be determined which kind of the or how they interpret or define our election. Right. And right. And Shahjar, of course, uh, when we talk about these elections, let's start with the US elections. Uh, considering uh, the global impact of uh, U.S. policies uh, on uh, all of these countries. Um, what's your opinion? Uh, how do you make of uh, the current race uh, that is uh, the presidential race uh, in the U.S. elections? So, Mariam, um, before going on to the uh, U.S. elections, uh, if we talk about the whole uh, global order, in 2023, it wasn't a very good year for democracy. We saw like globally in like a lot of like different countries and democratic systems that the personal freedoms have been curtailed. There was a rise in hate speech. There have been rise in global po uh, conflicts as well. Other than that, obviously climate change and all of these issues are like very pertinent. And we also saw that personal freedoms were curtailed across the world. So in that backdrop, the US elections will be very important this year. 
there is a still a very tough competition between the Republicans and the Democrats. President Biden is trying to uh, uh, stand up for another uh, four years, which will be a bit tricky given that they're getting intense competition from the Republican side. And even right now in two states, President Trump has been disallowed by their respective courts to stand in the elections. And now the Republican Party is going to the Supreme Court of the U.S. to basically see whether President Trump or the former President Trump, Trump would be able to take part in the elections as well. Other than that, if we look at his popularity, it's like very high. Of course. Especially with the two conflicts in uh, uh, one in Middle, Middle East, East one in uh, uh, Russia, war, Ukraine war, that has a profound impact on the Democratic Party as well. Because historically, a lot of like uh, minorities in the U.S. they basically uh, uh, vote for the Democratic Party. Hmm. Now, with the way the U.S. has handled the war between Israel and Hamas, a lot of like minority voters are now reluctant in like voting for President Biden. This will have a severe impact on the standing of the Democratic mm. Party. Especially with the protest uh, yeah. happening throughout the US. In the US and across the globe as of well. Course. And a lot of like countries have basically criticized the US's role when it comes to their policy in the Middle East. And that will have an impact on the votes that the Democratic Party was expecting from the, their minority voters. And I have a feeling that the Republican Party right now is in the lead when it comes to forming the next uh, government. Right, US. but let's talk about uh, the economic impacts of uh, the potential economic mm -hmm. impacts of these elections on uh, the world economy, especially the emerging economies and uh, multilateral groupings uh, that we have witnessed in the past few decades that have been emerging. Um, do you think that uh, both uh, presidential candidates have different uh, policies or uh, you would uh, you, uh, you make it as of continuity of the policies? So, uh, Mariam, the US being a leading global economic power, any policy that is made within the geo geographical con confines of the US has a profound impact on the rest of the world as well because it's a leading country when it comes to international financial institutions. Now that we see that there's a huge issue related to uh, inflation in the US as mm -hmm. well as the European Union, the interest rates are very high in the US as well. And that has an impact on the supply of capital across the globe. Mm. Now, will the inflation be curbed or be uh, contained in this year? And will the interest rates go down? This will have an impact on the international financial institutions and how the US and their Western allies are funding the two very uh, severe wars, one uh, between Russia and Ukraine. How long will the US system be able to fund the war uh, and do, uh, do you think that with the change in leadership, in case uh, Trump wins the presidential race, uh, there might be shift in uh, their foreign policy as well with regards to uh, these conflicts that are taking place in uh, war in Ukraine as well as, of course, uh, Middle East uh, issue? So let's like assume if the Republicans come into office and let's assume that President Trump has a high chance of like winning the elections again. These are two very big assumptions. Uh, when we look at the previous term of the President Trump, he was very insular in the way that he did not basically support American intervention outside or in the Middle East or in, uh, you know, across the globe. And he had like more of a mediation led policy. He mm. even had a good relationship with, uh, you know, Russia. He had a good relationship with China mm, and, with Saudi. and Saudi Arabia as well. So I think that the Republican Party would not be very interested in uh, funding uh, Ukraine indefinitely. I'm sure there will be some checks and balances, but the whole open kitty that was available to Zelensky in the form of the uh, Demo Democratic Party, that will end. And also, uh, when it comes to other uh, international powers, uh, I think uh, uh, President Trump, if he comes into power, he will be more inward focused and he will be more focused on developing the internal economy of the US rather than funding conflicts across the globe. Right. So let's talk about the elections that are going to be taking place in European Union this June as well. Um, do you think uh, that those elections are going to be impacting uh, the cohesion within the European Union, especially when we uh, to uh, talk about uh, the Brexit and, of course, uh, the rise of uh, far right parties uh, in uh, European Union? I think that the European Union members will be ch uh, have been checkmated since 2000. To, uh, 2022 uh, because of the Ukraine war. If there was no Ukraine war, definitely uh, the point which you were uh, identified that after Brexit, what is going to happen with the EU? 
because within the EU there was a more lead taken by the French and Germans. Mm. But after the nativization of the Europe because of the uh, Ukrainian war, uh, and especially when these two countries, Finland and uh, Sweden, gave up their two centuries neutrality and joined the NATO or expressed their one is now member and the other is still awaited. But that has created some kind of a cohesiveness. So I'm looking in the EU election, the more focus would be on the how to strengthen the security of the Europe. How to uh, you can say check the Russians' uh, assertiveness in the Europe. There will be a decisive factor within this election that how to deal with the as EU dealing with the China because China is uh, with this BRI initiative and with its three new initiatives: security development initiative, cultural, uh, civilizational uh, initiative, and the uh, third was developmental initiative. China is very much now knocking on the EU door and there it has a number of the linkages and uh, economically if you see the Asia is rising and within that context we have to see but there is another important thing is that if you see that when the in the post uh, October 7 and especially when the Israelis started butchering the Palestinian or innocent civilian Palestinian in Gaza after that we have seen that within the Europe there were mm, a lot, lot of, of voices, right. voices yes. and uh, my understanding is that still voices are there, the people are sensitive mm. and the governments in the Europe are insensitive. So that kind of a impact on that uh, EU election would be also witnessed that how you have to, they have to deal with the Middle Eastern conflict or in this emerging trend. Because if you see in the world today we say the cult of offensive is not dictating the global policies or the leading powers policies in the international politics within that context how the EU is going to look because EU is generally it seems it's European Union is an economic social political right. arrangement but do you think Fed confederation uh, not a military but NATO is also part of, course, of that. Of course, but do you think all these factors are going to be impacting uh, the unity and cohesion of uh, these European Union uh, states as well? Because like you rightly mentioned that there was insensitivity on the part of leadership of many of these European countries. But still, uh, we witnessed a few changes in these leadership roles as well uh, as time goes by and the protests uh, were, uh, you know, taking place throughout the world, especially in these countries. My, my, my understand, Mariam, is that uh, in this election, which is you pointed out in the summer, EU, you would be going to witness more cohesion. There will be more, you can say, uh, closeness. And the, because within the EU there is a fear, fear of the global development. From the one side, they are very much vulnerable because of the Russian assertiveness and what is happening in the Ukraine and number of the members of the EU are disturbed. Second is that the Middle Eastern crisis directly impact the, uh, impacts the EU because of the oil. Mm. And EU is dependent on for energy either on the Middle East or it was uh, some of the countries were dependent on the Russia. So how they are to look? So I think in the EU election, the biggest question would be that which kind of the world they are anticipating and how their energy security shall be ensured. Within this energy security, there was a, after the Fukushima Daiichi 2011, the Germans started saying, oh, we were distancing or we are closing the nuclear energy use. But now there is a new dimension that what we call it, especially in the COP28, the fusion energy, that how we are using the nuclear energy. So I think these are the issues. The EU election would be more focusing on the uh, how to uh, ensure the sustainability and progress of the EU economy. Right, but at the same time, uh, if UK's uh, Prime Minister Rishi Sonak also heads towards a potential election this year, uh, do you think the change in leadership is going to be impacting UK's relationship uh, with the European Union as well? Of course, that uh, change of leadership or UK, there, there's a difference, but uh, I think uh, if one can expect uh, that there will be a reversal of the Brexit in the near future, I think not. But uh, on the other side, the way the, uh, the things Engagement we, have, might uh, change. The, we have seen, of course, there will be, because when there is a, we have to keep in mind, EU is a, some kind of a, present us a model of a confederation. UK is a unitary state. 
and within that of course they were very much close on ally but now they have exited from the eu arrangement mm -hmm. so in this context i think that exit will continue of course uh, so let's move towards uh, south africa's election this is of course one of uh, important elections that are going to be taking place uh, can you elaborate on these elections and its potential impact especially when we uh, talk it uh, in the context of brics alliance as well so mariam when it comes to south africa we have to look at uh, their history it's been 30 years that they have transitioned from an apartheid state to a democratic state mm -hmm. and people haven't like forgotten the way uh, they were like treated the indigenous people of africa by the white settlers of that time this is one of the reasons why we basically see south africa taking a lead when it comes to the israel palestine issue yes. as well and they have very recently taken this whole case to the international ICC, criminal icc yes. as well and they are basically asking the icc to to basically investigate whether this comes under genocide as well and that's like one of the only countries that has taken this step so when it comes to the internal elections uh, of uh, south africa mm. so what strategic implications might arise if uh, anc uh, loses its majority uh, in terms of its ties with russia and china and of course its alliance and engagement with brics so brics alliance is very important when it comes to a new economic block that is emerging in the world and south africa is finding its place there in the next biggest economies other than the western and the us led models so um, i personally don't think that any change in government will change that stance but yes the uh, the division between the uh, south african society would be very important in these elections so the main competition right now is a coalition that is forming of the other democratic parties and the anc which is like already there and the friction between the ethnicities the ethnic groups or racial groups between south africa they are also defining uh, how the election will be taking place when it comes to the indigenous people they would definitely want to like take the uh, uh, government forward and the coalition that is like forming they want to like uh, come and like take part and like you know change their policy directions as well i personally think that uh, uh, corruption and the rise in crime in south africa that will also be one of the uh, talking points in these elections but mainly when it comes to the brics alliance i don't think south africa will be changing its position right so of course these engagements the global engagement and ties with uh, mm. russia and china uh, yeah. in context of brics uh, as well are going to be continuing uh, so um, dr jaspal what do you make of uh, the presidential elections that are going to be taking place in mexico in terms of its ties with united states and of course uh, especially when we talk about the border security issues i think that in and case of alliances. mexico uh, of course there will be the same trends will be continue within their state whatever the elections results are but the question which you would uh, 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 raise is that it's a, a relations with the united state it's always a troublesome though they have a linear border americans have a wire over it and immigration and smuggling and all these kind of the things are there but i think that the american policy will be becoming with reference to the mexico will be more clearer who will be in hmm. uh, washington Leadership, uh, like uh, in who, case who of will trump. be leading the yeah. white house hmm. uh, trump it will be entirely different and uh, or the same democrat is a different face hmm. or a republican is a different face or a democrat so uh, i think that will be determined by that way right so let's move to our region and talk about the election situation uh, uh, elections that are going to be taking place in bangladesh uh, do you think that uh, the continuity uh, of the government uh, when uh, if sheikh hasina is expected uh, victory um, in these elections uh, how do you think they are going to be impacting ties uh, with neighboring countries and of course the impact of uh, bangladesh uh relations with other multilateral organizations i think that uh, the way the election is there if we can focus on the one decade performer, performance of uh this uh, sina wajid sheikh sina wajid she performed well but on the other side in the last election 2018 and prior to that she used the state machinery in order to win the election uh, within the state generally it is said that the again this year the second leading party is going to boycott the election so naturally <coughs> it's written on the card that more authoritarianism is coming and uh, in that context the election will be uh, you can say won by the uh, the asina wise party 
And, uh, but at the same time, you cannot ignore demonstrations of these kind of things. Some of our policies have disturbed the international community, especially arresting and charging the Nobel laureate. And interestingly, we have seen in the case of Bangladesh, Americans wanted, and Bangladesh is playing a very balancing strategy. On the one side, they are part of the uh, BRI, there is a corridor. And on the other side, the Americans desire to keep the Bangladesh in their own fold, but the, at the same time, they are very much disturbed, especially they criticize the Sinawai's policies of, you can say, arresting mm, and political prosecution dissent, and the course. political uh, maneuvering or dictator, uh, dictatorship. But on the other side, they cannot too much push it because they know that then it will go into the fold of the China. It's very interesting. The, uh, uh, Sina Wajid and her party are very significant and uh, they were they, historically they had a very close ties with the Delhi, whosoever was in Delhi. But during the recent years, we have seen that uh, they both were not on a comfortable footing. She visited the, as an observer in the BRICS and then in the uh, G820. And in one of them, Asina tried to have a bilateral one-to-one -one talks with the Prime Minister Modi on the sideline, but Modi did not because they are not supporting the Bangladesh in the BRICS because they think if Bangladesh enter in it, it will be China, Russia will be strengthening that. So India is a little bit upset. So in this context, the Bangladesh is maintaining a balancing strategy. But if you see Bangladesh is participating in the UN. When you look about the multilateral UN peacekeepers, and it's a very important in the Asia Pacific, and mm. within the Asia Pacific, it soldiers it is participating in the Asia Pacific security arrangement. So the elections in Bangladesh, analysts, for example, I was just reviewing a time report. They say if there will be a free and fair election, then she will be losing. But the the indicators are all the opposition forces are behind the bars. And uh, then probably she will be winning and there will be a continuity of the policy. Continuity of the policy. So uh, when we talk about our region, of course, elections uh, that are going to be taking place uh, in Sri Lanka are also very important. What do you make of uh, these elections, especially when we know that the country has been fighting uh, with economic instability? Do you think that is going to be changing uh, with uh, the new leadership coming in? or uh, also the current uh, presidential uh, of course president is going to be uh, you know um, of course um, uh, 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 continuing uh, his um, his of course leadership role so mariam when it comes to sri lanka the economic issues or the economic uh, reform agenda that sri lanka has going forward into the next democratic process it's very similar to pakistan as well mm. because we're having like same issues other than that pakistan is also going security issues as well but when it comes to economic challenges sri lanka and uh, pakistan are like more or less on the same path pakistan will also be going to the more imf's on the same role. Path, but they toppled over their government and we can't compare it so the only difference is that uh, uh, sri lanka like went the president through had to step down because uh, the country declared default of course of course and because so, pakistan so with with the elections yeah. happening do you think uh, sri lanka is going to be uh, moving towards a path of political and economic uh, stability I think Sri Lanka will currently be looking outwards because it, it, will, it will need like a lot of like alliances in the region to basically bail it out or help them with economic reforms. So if we s look at Sri Lanka's foreign policy, it's like very close to uh, India and it's also looking at China as well for investments that need to bring the, the economy out of the water. Other than that, Sri Lanka is also looking westward as well. And we have to like see they're just coming out of an IMF uh, program as well. And they're also looking to extend it to get more support for their domestic uh, economic like uh, uh, well-being. So uh, going forward into 2024, they would be looking at a more uh, neutral policy in the region. They would be wanting to get more close to a balance between India and China as well. And to look at international financial institutions, Western financial institutions to bail them out and to go on the path of reforms. Of course. So uh, let's move uh, towards uh, the elections that are going to be taking place in Pakistan and India. Uh, they are important and of course uh, there is a lot of 
hopes as well as anticipation surrounding these elections uh, if we talk about Pakistan as well as India. Um, how do you see these elections uh, interplay, uh, especially uh, with the change of leadership or the continuity of the policies in case of uh, Modi government? I think that in India, uh, Modi will be going to win. The trend indicates that uh, he will be winning the third term. And uh, winning the third term with majority, and this trend is supported by the recent elections in the uh, state elections in India. Generally, we were expecting that when there was a 26 parties coalition, India, led by the Congress against the BJP, it will perform well. In the general election, maybe there will be some kind of a, but general trend is there. Because the Indian military industry are complex, and especially big business is supportive to the Modi, media is supportive to the Modi. And Modi is using harsh, he's becoming a dictator within India, if you see. Recently, parliamentarians were suspended. Opposition leader was, you can say, thrown out of the parliament. So, with all these tactics, it is he's going to win. But the problem with the Modi is that minorities are upset there. Not only Muslim, but other minorities are. Whether it's a Manipur, whether it's a Northwest India, whether it's a Kashmir, uh, minorities are upset. But the Western nations are the so-called uh, uh, propagators of the democratic or human uh, democracy and human rights. They are silent over it because Modi is also doing. But Modi is also playing a game. He has uh, now his foreign minister was recently visited the Russia and there they agreed on number of the contracts and similarly they are trying to play with United States because in the last one uh, few months Modi lost some kind of uh, mm -hmm. uh, you can say some uh, in the case of United States for, uh, planet because the president uh, Trump agreed during the. 20, uh, G20 summit to be a chief guest at the Republican Day on 26 January 2024, mm. but uh, now he refused because of the uh, the Modi government's this uh, clandestine killing in, the, uh, in Canada, and they were working to kill a sixth leader in or US American well. American uh, in on the in New York, so that could be the difference. But for me, whatever his foreign or strategic policy could be, but the most worrying sum is that. If Modi's feel that he's losing the popularity or his slogans are not coming up, he is going to have a false flag as he did in the case of 2019 uh, general election. Yes. So for Pakistan till April, May, especially February, March are very critical. We can expect any kind of the military adventurism from the Indian side and we, have, we must be mentally prepared for it. And uh, and for that, in Indian elections, uh, we cannot ignore, we cannot take. Of course, take. of course. And especially, what the generally people are focusing, what will be the outcome of the election, who will be the leader or who will be the prime minister. For me, the more important Indian election is these election, uh, to, uh, what you call it, 2024 general elections campaign months. Mm -hmm. I mean that the uh, February, March, April, especially February, March, are very critical for Pakistan's security. Of course, and uh, very rightly pointed out. And of course, we did a complete show on India's false flag operations, especially uh, considering the history of um, Modi's election campaigns. It is uh, focused on anti-Pakistan agenda. Uh, but with 900 million uh, Indian voters, do you think there is going to be a change or shift in India's policies, especially uh, towards its neighbors or its approach towards the global alliances, uh, keeping in mind its, uh, you know, kind of strained relations with US as well as with Canada and other Western countries are also raising questions uh, over these human rights violations uh, and these actions um, uh, by, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, of course, the state agencies of India. Do you think uh, it uh, is no, going to be a factor? We have to see, first of all, what is the basis or a determinant of U.S.-India relations or strategic partnership, which has now entered into the third phase, which we call it threshold alliance. The basic reasoning of this, uh, you can say, cooperation or uh, closeness is China. Rise of China, it is still there. So it means that whatever you can find, uh, some ups and downs, or this, but India and China, strategic, uh, this uh, threshold alliance will further mature in the coming 
uh, months whether Modi or anybody else or whether Trump or Biden or Republicans or Democrats. So this is first thing we have to keep in mind that this ups and downs are small uh, that is not coming. It will be not going to affect the basic nature of the India-US relationship. Second is in this context, India's behavior towards the neighbors, it will become more haunting. I mean by haunting means it is uh, going to dictate the neighbors. India thinks that it is a net security provided in the Indian Ocean. It will create a problem for the Indian Ocean countries. India has shifted in a policy on Palestine because of I2U2, it will continue. India will be remain an active member of Quad. Whosoever is in Delhi, India will be going to demand AUKUS Plus. So India's militarization, India's partnership, what we call it security alliances partnership, whether Modi or anybody else. But of course, Modi will be there. So in this context, everything which you expect, it will be going to create more instability within the region because India will be going to act as a great power or hegemon in the region, especially in South Asia, which is not acceptable to these neighbors, whether they are small or big. Right, but uh, with the potential of a surprise defeat for Modi, uh, what strategic uh, ramifications might arise? So I personally think that BJP is in full control and uh, the chances are, and like the way things are going, BJP is set to form another government as well because the opposition in India is very divided and it's not really representing the will of the people. The whole transition of the Indian uh, democracy uh, towards right-wing nationalist politics it's like uh, taken a lot of like toll on the local population of uh, India. Other than that, India's rise economically and the middle class expansion has had a profound impact and a lot of people basically equate that to uh, Modi's nationalist parties as well. And a lot of like, uh, I would say progressive elements of Indian society, they're also on the back foot now. Because, you know, the local population and the expansion of uh, the Indian uh, middle class is pointing towards more economic prosperity, even though it comes at a cost of uh, marginalizing the uh, minorities of India. So, uh, what India would be uh, but doing... But in, in case of a surprise defeat for Modi, do you think there are, is going to be a change uh, or shift in India's uh, foreign policy towards its neighbors and uh, towards the global alliances? If uh, by a miracle the Congress party wins, the chances of that are very minimum they would be more uh, uh, considerate or open to having a more, uh, uh, you know, a proactive regional policy, I would say. Um, but the chances, I don't see like that happening uh, currently in this uh, elections. Right. Uh, so, Sharia, mm. let's talk about the economic impacts of uh, these elections. Do you think all these elections with over more than 64 mm. countries of the world uh, are going to be maybe electing uh, their uh, representatives or in some countries mm. there are functional democracies, in others there are not? Uh, do you think uh, this is going to be a year of volatility in terms of economics of the country, of the globe? So, Mariam, um, uh, that is a very good question if you want to like sum up how the whole democratic system in the world basically works. Is that I personally see that there has been a democratic decline uh, from 2023 and I think that democratic decline or democratic backsliding, we call it, will continue in 2024. Even so, the, when the, we basically go into elections, elections are a part of democracy, you know. But there are like a lot of other indicators that are very important in a functioning, vibrant democracy. That is that the democratic pr process should reflect the will of the people. And we've seen in 2023 with a lot of like conflicts in like Israel, if you look at the Ukrainian-Russian conflict, the will of the people hasn't been reflected when it comes to the party leaders mm. or the global leaders of the world. Mm. So and there is a lot of dissatisfaction, especially in the Western democracies, about exactly. the very concept of democracy yeah. as well. So all the personal freedoms that people used to enjoy, especially in the Western capitals, they're also like on the down low as well. Mm. So when it comes to freedom of expression that is being curtailed, when it comes to rising in Islamophobia, rising conflicts, uh, personal freedoms, freedoms being curtailed, we've like seen that happening in the European Union, which claims mm. itself to be the bastion of human rights and global freedoms as well. Mm. So even though there are like a lot of elections uh, taking place, a lot of leaderships will basically change. But overall, democratic ideals across the globe, I think they're like shrinking and they're like going on the back burner. So that is like something very important where, which we have to see. And as you mentioned, uh, next year, I think the like, conflicts and the polarity in the world will increase. 
the world will more shift towards more uh, geopolitical uh, conflicts. The whole competition between the US and China will rise. Uh, by the way, th uh, Taiwan is also going into elections in January as well, and that could also have a potential to be divisive because China basically claims Taiwan course, as its own territory, ter territory as well. So those elections will also be very important on how the uh, global geopolitics uh, and uh, global geodynamics will be taking place. Of course. But I see a lot of these like conflicts becoming more pronounced, and I see a lot of like. Uh, uh, divisions in the world mm. when it comes more to volatility. more volatility, mm -hmm. more economic blocks emerging, more uh, geopolitical blocks emerging as well. Uh, the role India will be playing will be very important because it's in all alliances as well. And India will also have to choose. They are claiming to have an independent foreign policy up till now. But as these conflicts will become more uh, apparent, India will also have to basically claim on which side they actually are on. So that will also be very important. Right. So lastly, Dr. Jaspal, in the midst of all these election complexities, uh, what lessons Pakistan can draw for, from all these global elections uh, that we can maybe implement to ensure our own transparency in elections? I think that except Bangladesh in all the other countries which you have identified, people will be accepting the results of the elections. So we have to accept that. So our political leadership requires that they meet, have a consensus, and on the basis <coughs> of that, there shall be a consensus. Whosoever will be going to win, whichever party win, they have to respect the ballot or the respect the outcome of the election. That is the one thing which we have to learn from a mature democracy. Second is, that uh, people must have a trust. Because if we have, a, in the election, natural majority wins. Majority comes and it go for a implementing. And, but majority has to take into account minorities concerns. We have seen in number of the countries, though in India, this is a new trend that uh, marginalizing the opposition, but generally they also accept it. But in Bangladesh, they marginalized in Pakistan. We have a negative trends that we marginalize the opposition. That trend must change. So we have to learn from the world that opposition is the next government. We have to respect the opposition as right. well. Right. Thank you very much, Dr. Zafar Nawaz Jaspal, for joining us in today's program. Thank you very much, Mr. Sher Yar Khan, for joining us in today's program. Uh, of course, uh, in today's program, uh, we discussed uh, about and explored uh, the complexities of uh, these uh, global elections. And as Pakistan is standing on the brink of its own elections, uh, we leave you uh, with these reflections uh, and the global impacts that lie ahead. That's all from Game Changer tonight. Take care. Allah Hafiz.